Okay, well, good morning. It is great to be back with you all. For those who are unaware, um, I and some of our other adults here led a group of our high schoolers on a mission trip to Romania, and we got back late Tuesday night. It's awesome to be back and worshiping with you guys. Um, I noticed a lot of faces that I personally don't know, so welcome. Uh, We are glad to have you worshiping with us together this morning. Um, I would also be remiss not to mention the fact that... um, Selfishly, I am the youth pastor here, and we have a youth group that meets on Wednesday nights. So for those of you who are um, going into 6th through 12th grade, we'd love to have you guys join us, um, hang out. And we also have um, four incoming 7th through 12th graders. we got a summer camp at the end of this month. You guys are welcome to get uh, signed up for that. Love to have you guys there and see you there. Um, but let's jump into this morning's message. Before we do, let's pray. Father, thank you for today, for the sunshine and the uh, moderate temperature. It is a joy to worship you in your creation, and I thank you for the opportunity that we have to do that here. I pray that you'd be with us today as we study your word. I pray that you would speak to us through it, God, that um, your words would come alive to us, and that we would be encouraged and challenged to better live for you in light of it, and I ask these things in your name. Amen. All right. So I mentioned that we just got back from Romania. It was quite a trip. We got a good taste of what it is like to be a foreigner in a land that is not our own. Because even though uh, there were some similarities, for instance, we eat food, they also eat food. Um, We speak, they also speak. The food that they eat, the words that they use are different from ours. Things are different there. The scenery is even different. Um, They don't really have mountains there. There's one region of the country that has mountains and the rest is mostly flat with a little bit of rolling hills and valleys, which was fun to see. It was nice to shake things up a little bit. But on one of our long van rides at one point, um, one of the girls mentioned that she missed seeing the mountains. And uh, it was just little things like that that just were different enough that it didn't feel like home. Trees were never taller than about 30 feet high. Um, The flowers and plants looked very different. Architecture style was different. Um, uh, The language was different. I mean, there were some things that we could understand because Romanian is a Latin-based language, so my four years of high school Spanish helped me understand a little bit, but by and large, the language was lost on us. Um, The food was different. I mean, they still have some of the staples. They eat meat, bread, and cheese like we do, but um, a lot of the way that they make things and prepare things is different. One of the weirdest things to adjust to when it came to food was, for us, dinner is typically the big meal of the day. Um, and for them, lunch is the big meal of the day. And that was weird. I mean, I, I am the sort of person that lunch is basically a glorified snack where I eat a lot for breakfast and then lunch holds me over until dinner where I then eat a lot again. But for them, you cram the most amount of food in the middle of the day. That was just an odd thing to adjust to. There were a lot of um, unique challenges and things that were different. One thing that we noticed with the culture that was different was that um, people placed a very, very high priority on your shoes and your car. Um, We saw a lot of sports cars and muscle cars there and a lot of fancy looking shoes. And you can always tell which shoes are the fanciest because they typically are the ones that are the ugliest. And there was a lot of ugly shoes. But the missionaries that we partnered with there told us that there are many families that they are familiar with and that they work with who choose to not buy food for an entire month so that they can use the amount of money that they would use on food to buy a new pair of shoes. Um, Shoes are like a major status symbol for them. And I mean, we like shoes too. We care about shoes, but not to the same extent or degree that they do. So things were just different. Scenery was different. Food was different. Language was different. Culture was different. Priorities are different. Everything is different. And it was hard in some ways to adjust to some of those things. But if that wasn't enough, the actual process of traveling for us was also very hard. Some of you may have been made aware um, for probably prayer requests sake or for story's sake after the fact that one of our adult leaders, Bethany, um, lost her passport in London 
we uh, had an eight-hour-ish layover in London, and we took a train to Paddington Station, and we went around and got to do some exploring. We got to have some lunch, some authentic uh, London fish and chips, and just see some of London. It was really cool, um, the first real adventure that we got to have together as a team. But on the ride home, she said she put her passport in one pocket and knew that she put it in that pocket, and then when we got out at the airport, she felt her pocket and it wasn't in there anymore. And so for about three hours, she and I went and talked to security people, and they told us to wait, and so we would wait, and then we'd get tired of waiting and talk to security people, and then we got on some trains and rode the trains back and forth looking for the passport ourselves, still couldn't find it, talked to more security people. Um, all they really did was say, if we find it, we'll give you a call. Not super helpful. And then we went to the airline security check-in station and talked to them to see if there was anything we could do. They said basically she was up a creek without a paddle, without a passport. They wouldn't even fly her back to the U.S. She was stranded in London. And so the panic was starting to rise, and um, the our leaders kind of talked and powwowed and, and decided that Bethany and then my wife Jamie would stay behind in London and the rest of us continued on to Bucharest. And there was a lot of anxiety and stress about what's going to happen. Are they going to be stuck in London? When will they get to leave? Um, but thankfully, God was faithful and answered our very many prayer requests. And over the next several hours, their, uh, the passport was found. And the next day, they were able to retrieve it and then get the next available flight to Bucharest. But it was an exhausting process. And if we would have been fixated on... Uh, all of the stuff that was going wrong, it would have been really easy for us to ask, why are we doing this? What, what's the point of all of this? Why did I take a group of miners halfway around the world for two weeks? This is not going well. Um, but we kept our focus in that we were ultimately doing this to partner with what God is doing in the world. And that kept our eyes fixed on the prize, basically. And because of that, we were able to get to our destination and have good attitudes and put in the work that we needed to put in. And God was faithful and he did the work that he needed to do to make sure that we all got there safe and sound and made it back home. It was a good thing, but it also helped us to recognize something that is really at the heart of what we're going to talk about this morning, which is that living life as a foreigner, traveling is a hard thing to do. And the Bible tells us that as Christians, we are called foreigners in this world, that we are living our lives sojourning, traveling through this life until the day when God brings us into his kingdom. The Bible calls us as Christians citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. And it says that we are foreigners in this world, that this world is not truly our home. We are sojourning here. We are temporarily here like exiles awaiting the day when we will return to the place that is actually our home. And just like with travel, the, the world around us can suck us in. It can distract us from what really matters and what's really important. We know that God is, is our king. We understand the basic truth of the Bible. I, I guarantee that most anybody here would be able to say, if you said, what does the Bible tell us? The most important thing is that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. And the Bible tells us that to, to love God is to obey God. And so if we want to faithfully love God, we will obey God by living the way that he wants us to live. And if he is our king and he has set up a kingdom that he's brought us in as citizens of, then there's an expectation that as Christians, we will live according to the laws of that kingdom. We understand that. We know that. There's no need for us to do a sermon series about loving God because that's pretty basic to our faith and to our understanding. Even non-Christians can understand that. And yet... Even though that is so plain and easy for us to understand, how hard is it actually for us to live for God obediently day by day, moment by moment? It's really easy for us to be at work or school or something, and we're not actively th <clears throat> thinking about God or about the Bible and then all of a sudden we get an email from some guy that's generally not very kind at work and then we're thinking about that and then we've got these 
not super nice thoughts rolling around in our head about that person. Then we go to a break time and then we're talking to somebody just shooting the breeze on a 15 minute break and they might bring up that person. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh yeah, that person's such a jerk and yada, yada, yada. And all of a sudden now we have spent a big part of our day choosing to um, be unkind towards someone, to gossip about someone, to, to dishonor a person who has been created in the image of God. Our culture doesn't have a problem with that. Our culture says, no, that's normal, that's fine. You can complain about other people. You can talk about other people behind their back, whatever. You should just at least be nice to them to their face. But you can say whatever you want about a person. But the kingdom of God says that's such the opposite of how we should live. And as citizens of God's heavenly kingdom, that can be hard for us. Our, the, our culture, the worldly culture, says that you can sleep with whomever you want, wherever you want, whenever you want, however you want, and that's fine, that's acceptable, that's your business. But God's kingdom and citizens of God's kingdom should know that we're only to sleep with those that we've committed ourselves to in marriage faithfully as husband and wife. And the culture tells us that you can spend your time however you want. Do whatever makes you happy. Spend your time doing the things that you really enjoy. If that's playing video games, then go play video games. If that's scrolling through social media and TikTok and whatever, spend your time doing that. But citizens of God's heavenly kingdom know that we're supposed to use our time in a way that honors and glorifies God. Our culture tells us all sorts of things that go contrary to what it looks like to be a citizen of God's heavenly kingdom. From the words that we use, to the things that we think, to the ways that we spend our money or our time, to the actions that we uh, choose to do. All of the things um, that we do as citizens of God's kingdom look very different from what it looks like to be a citizen of the world. There's a night and day contrast between our true citizenship and our earthly citizenship. It's not hard for us to see that and, and understand that. And yet it's so hard for us to choose to live for God anyway. This morning we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1. And the books of First and Second Peter are something that we as a team studied together in Romania, talking about what it looks like to be foreigners in this life, to be sojourners through this life. And this is um, fresh for our team, but this chapter really, I think, set us up for understanding how we can choose to live for God in this world, choosing to be citizens of his kingdom rather than citizens of this earth. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me there. What I'd like for us to do is to sort of just work through this chapter together bit by bit, beginning in verse 1. First Peter chapter 1, uh, verses, let's go 1 and 2 first. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now it begins by uh, introducing the person who was responsible for authoring this. This is a letter um, that was included in the biblical canon of scripture from one of Jesus' closest followers, uh, the apostle named Peter. And Peter says he is writing this to God's chosen people, or the translation I just read out of said the elect exiles in the dispersion. Now, this term, God's chosen people, is a very deeply biblical term. If you are familiar with stories in the Old Testament, stories of the people of Israel, you have heard this term. It pops up all over the place. Um, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, 2 Chronicles 6, verse 6, Psalm 33, 12, all over the place, we hear God's people referred to, the Israelites, they're referred to as God's chosen people. And here, Peter describes who it is that he's writing to. He doesn't say, I'm writing to Israel or to the Israelites. He says, I'm writing to those who are in the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These uh, names of places that sound ancient that you're probably unfamiliar with were a list of regions in what is today called Turkey, the country of Turkey, but was called Asia Minor. 
And Peter was saying that I am writing to those of you who have been dispersed to these different areas. Now, if you read through 1 Peter, what you will notice is that many times Peter mentions that he is writing to Gentiles. And Gentile was a term for non-Israelites. So it would be confusing then why Peter would lead off this letter saying that he is writing to God's chosen people, a very Israelite term, and yet he is writing to people who are not exclusively Israelites. He may have included some Israelites in his, uh, as his uh, audience, but that is not exclusively who he's writing to here. And so what Peter is saying is that those who follow Jesus now, not just the Israelites, are God's chosen people. That if we choose to follow God faithfully as his people, we are included as God's chosen people, meaning he chose you and he chose me to live as citizens of his kingdom which is incredible. And Peter follows that up by saying God's chosen people in the dispersion. This is, seems like a bit of a weird term. Your translation, if you're reading along, it might say something like in the diaspora, which is an even weirder term. But this is a term that comes from about 600 years earlier in history where God's chosen people, the Israelites, had disobeyed God, and so he raised up the ancient civilization known as Babylon in order to conquer the Israelite people and scatter them. These scattered Israelites were called the dispersion. This event was called the diaspora. And so what Peter is doing is connecting us as Christians who live as foreigners in this world to the idea of the Israelites being in exile, who were removed from their home in Israel in order to live faithfully for God even though they were scattered around to all of these new and different places. Peter is saying that remember all of these faithful followers of God from history. People like Adam, who was removed from the Garden of Eden. People like Abraham and Sarah, who were removed from their land um, of Ur in order to go to the place that God would lead them. And Abraham and Sarah's descendants, Isaac and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel that would come from Jacob's family lineage, who wandered through the wilderness looking for their home under Moses' leadership. Um, Peter is recalling all of the sojourners that have come from the history of uh, God's people found in the Bible and identifying us with them, saying that as followers of Jesus, we now have the opportunity to follow in this tradition of sojourning that has been prepared for us by all of these faithful followers of God from history up to this point. Peter's saying, look at all of these examples from history All of you Christians, come along and follow us. Look at all of the ways that they have been faithful and follow their example. And Peter then in uh, verse 2 connects something very important about these sojourners to what he's going to say in the rest of this chapter. He says, to those who are God's chosen people in the dispersion, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. We see here in verse 2, Peter is saying that we as Christians have been brought into citizenship in God's kingdom by a complete work of God. God as Father foreknew that we would be his people, meaning he planned ahead preparing to bring us into his kingdom. And we were brought in by the sanctification of the Spirit, meaning being set apart by the Holy Spirit of God that comes to live inside of Christians when we choose to put our faith in Jesus who died for us, sprinkling his blood. Basically, what Peter is saying is that God has put all of his total and complete focus and attention on bringing us the salvation that makes us his people. This is incredible and incredibly important as Peter leads into what he does with the rest of chapter 1. In verses 3 through 12, Peter basically sings a song of praise for the salvation that God brings to us as Christians. And in the remainder of the chapter, verses 13 through 25, he unpacks and explains this salvation and what we should do about it. And so first, let's jump into the song, verses 3 through 12. Um, Let's start with verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There's a little bit of an order of operations here that Peter goes into. He says, first, God raised Jesus. Then, through Jesus, we are made born again. 
And then third, this gives us a, the term is great expectation or a great hope. And he explains that our expectation is about an inheritance that we will now come into. As uh, citizens of God's heavenly kingdom, we get to inherit certain blessings, which is a good thing and should lead us to our response, how Peter began this verse, all praise and glory and honor to God. In verses 4 and 5, he explains the inheritance. He says, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our inheritance is described as being untouchable. It is safely waiting for us until the day that God establishes his kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth. So right now we're living as these foreigners, these sojourners in the world, waiting for God to establish his kingdom here so that we can live for him and with him forever, faithfully, and fully. But right now we're still waiting. Peter says we get to experience some aspects of our salvation, but ultimately we are waiting for it in its fullness yet still. It has not yet fully come, which is why this world looks different from God's kingdom. If this world had already been fully um, established in God's kingdom, then we wouldn't have sin and death and brokenness and sadness and pain. All of these things that are associated with the world would go away. We're still living in it. And so we're expecting this inheritance when we live with God in beauty and perfection and goodness, devoid of pain and sorrow forever. It's still awaiting us, but it's described as an inheritance. Inheritance is a interesting concept where someone else has spent their life working for something that someone else will then take because you can't take it with you when you die. And so typically the process of receiving inheritance looks like a person dies and then uh, the relative or whomever the inheritance is bestowed to receives that inheritance and then people live their lives now in light of this new inheritance. Typically that leads to people being a bit of a snob, having a bad attitude, um, living luxurious lifestyles, those sorts of things. When we imagine like a big inheritance, that's the sort of thing we typically envision. We, we envision somebody receiving this major gift and then living selfishly, self-centeredly. But this is a much different kind of inheritance. Instead of receiving this inheritance through someone's death, we actually receive this inheritance through someone's life. Jesus died, but he came back to life in order to bring us this inheritance. And when we receive this inheritance, instead of living for ourselves, the Bible uses this term glory or glorification, where we live with and for God forever in a world that is very, very good, devoid of the brokenness and the pain that we experience now. This is something worth looking forward to. And this is in large part why citizenship in God's kingdom looks very different from citizenship in this world. The difference between heaven and earth is dramatic. And this inheritance is a sort of epitome of an example of why and how they are so dramatically different. And so Peter says we should be living for our heavenly inheritance rather than anything we could receive in this life because you may be able to receive something good in this life but ultimately you will die and it'll get passed on to someone else. You can't do anything with it. But our inheritance was given to us by someone's resurrection which will include our own resurrection to an eternal life. A very good thing. And Peter's response to this very good thing in verse six is this. In this you rejoice though now for a little while if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. In verse 6, he says there's highs and lows. There is incredible joy that comes from citizenship in God's kingdom, but there are also trials. When we put our faith in Jesus, things will be excellent. We will receive joy. But at the same time, things will be challenging and difficult because now we are living as a foreign citizen in this world. And as a foreign citizen, we lose a lot of the rights and privileges that we were previously able to experience. Whereas before, we could live according to the culture. We could speak the same kind of language as them. Now we are told that we need to put those things aside. And when we put those things aside, the world doesn't like that. They say, wait a minute, you're weird. You're different. You are antithetical to the way that we live. And because of that, we don't like you. And because of that, we might say mean things to you. We might say mean things about you. We might do mean things to you. 
And the world uh, has given us no shortage, shortage of examples of the way that they might create trials for us as Christians in the last 2,000 years of history. Peter, the person responsible for writing these words to us, was crucified for his faith. And the story goes that he was crucified upside down because he didn't want to be identified too closely with Jesus. He didn't want to die in the same way that his savior died. So he asked to be crucified upside down. But crucifixion was a horribly painful way to die. And many other followers of Jesus throughout human history have been persecuted for their faith. They have been tortured, they have be been beaten, they have been, been, they have been bruised, and they have even been killed for their faith. And we are saying that we are identifying on the side of all of these people who are getting beat up and killed for this citizenship. And what do we have to show for it? We get to have less fun than some of our peers? That doesn't sound right. Except for that if we understand that the thing that we're really anticipating is this inheritance that comes in the future um, that's actually far greater than anything that we could experience in this life, then it makes a little bit more sense of why we'd be willing to suffer and endure these things. And Peter is writing to help us to say... Yes, this world is hard and following Jesus is hard, but if you follow him faithfully now, the blessings will be excellent as you uh, eventually reach his new heavens and new earth. And verse 7, he explains why these trials are necessary. He says, um, you have been grieved by various trials, verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. These trials are necessary both to test us, to test the genuineness of our faith, and also to bring us purification in our faith so that we can receive that great reward. Remember, we experience salvation in part, but ultimately that salvation doesn't come in its fullness until the day that we meet Jesus face to faith, face, either because we die or because he comes back, whichever one happens first. And so these trials are given to us for two purposes, to test our mettle, and to purify us in that process. Both of these are uh, metal working terms. You would use fire to test the strength of a metal, but also to purify that metal in order to use it for something, to shape it and to sharpen it into what it's supposed to be. And Peter is saying that while we are living in this world, God is allowing us to undergo these trials in order to strengthen our faith and mold us into better citizens of his heavenly kingdom, ready and deserving of the inheritance that we are going to someday receive. This is what we are anticipating. In verses 8 and 9, he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He's saying that our faith is a trust in the God that we have not seen, and it is expressed in love. And it's because of our faith in God expressed through love that we would then receive this inheritance. There is a um, theme that runs throughout the New Testament that is something that Christians like to stay away from, which is something that Jesus says that, it's one thing to acknowledge God. It's another thing to live for God. And if you simply acknowledge God but don't live for God, God is not going to live with you. James says it this way. Do you have faith in God? Do you believe that God is real? Good. Even the demons believe that. So having an understanding that God is real and that his word is true doesn't really do anything for you unless you actually choose to live for God. Putting your faith in God means pledging your allegiance to his kingdom, which means living like a citizen of his kingdom, which looks very different from this earth. It's not enough for us to just acknowledge that God is real, to say, oh yeah, I know that there's a God out there. I totally believe that God's real. We have to actually choose to live for God. That's how we express our faith. And when we do that, we receive the inheritance that we are waiting for. In verses 10 through 12, he says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Peter says the salvation of God is so wonderful 
that the prophets and angels, people that are, live in legend for us, that who have done these incredible things for God, spiritual and supernatural beings even, are eagerly awaiting what God is going to give to us when we follow him faithfully. It kind of explains it like these prophets and these angels are sitting in a movie theater watching our lives unfold, watching God's grand scheme throughout time unfold on a movie theater, sitting on the edge of their seat, just munching on their popcorn and candy, waiting to see what God is going to do, waiting to see the dramatic conclusion to this and the happy ending that we get to experience at the end of it all. And this is how Peter wraps up this song of salvation. How good is this salvation that even prophets anticipated it and angels are longing to see it fulfilled? And then Peter explains how we can prepare for salvation in the remainder of this chapter. In verse 13, he says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here we get our... our our explanation for what we're supposed to do about the salvation. He starts by saying that we need to prepare. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. The word for prepare is only used one time in the Bible, right here. This is the only time this word shows up in the entire Bible, in the original Greek that the Bible was, that the New Testament was written in. And this word meant uh, to gird up which is basically when you take a strap of leather, like a belt or something, and you tie the loose clothing around your legs to yourself um, to prepare for battle or to prepare for travel. This was basically a term used um, militarily for soldiers, saying that you need to prepare yourselves for battle. You need to make sure everything's tied down, that everything's tight, that everything's ready to go for you to jump in and do battle. And the same term was applied to travelers who would get ready for a long journey. They needed to saddle up, tie down and make sure that they were totally ready to go and prepared for everything that would accompany them in this journey. Peter is saying, like a soldier ready for battle or a traveler ready for a long trip, we need to prepare ourselves as citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. He says, with sober minds for understanding, to be sober-minded and set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you with the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, sober-minded, he's not literally saying you need to be sober, although scripture does also command us to be sober. But what he actually means by that is we need to have such clarity of thought and focus that nothing is distracting us from this preparation, that we have fully set our attention to what? To our hope being fully on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter is saying that the greatest way for us as Christians to prepare ourselves for our inheritance, to live for God here on this earth, is to actively prepare ourselves day by day to focus on God. Very, very simply, as easily as that. Um, Bruce Lee, the famous martial artist and actor, was um, attributed with saying, the successful warrior is the average man with laser-like focus. I think if we kind of take what the heart of Bruce Lee is saying there and apply it to what Peter says, basically, if we really want to live for God, to go from just being a normal person on this earth to a real citizen of God's heavenly kingdom, that takes intentional focus on God every single day, moment by moment. Focus on the right things is crucial for our spiritual excess. And so to experience salvation, we must keep focused on the hope of our glorification. And Peter unpacks this a little bit, verses 14 through 16. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. It's saying God is not just our king, he's also our heavenly father. And so because of that, we need to not just be obedient citizens, but also obedient children. Just as we're supposed to obey our parents, we need to obey God. And it doesn't just say we're supposed to obey him because he's our father. What did it say in verse 16? You shall be holy for I am holy. The reason that we are supposed to um, be obedient to God isn't just because he's our father. It isn't just because he's our king. It's actually because he's holy. He's perfect. And if we want to really be his children, if we really want to be his citizens, we need to live like him, to be holy like he is holy. And Peter gives a little bit of a warning in the next verse, verse 17. He says, and if you call on him as father 
who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout your time of your exile. He says God is impartial. He rewards those who deserve rewarding and he punishes those who deserve punishment. He does so equitably. God is fair. God is just. And therefore, we should live in a reverent fear of this fair and just God. In verses 18 through 20, he continues, Knowing that you were ransomed from such futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without spot or blemish, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. He says, we were ransomed from our sin by something more precious than silver or gold or treasure. It is the blood of his own son that brought us salvation that God chose before the creation of the world when he foreknew us. God has been planning from before time began to shed his own blood in order to bring us this salvation. It is a very big deal. And Peter wants us to see that. In verses 21 through 25, Peter wraps up this section with a little bit of a poem. He says, Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. In these last couple of verses, Peter kind of uses a rhetorical feature that a lot of times biblical authors would use called parallelism, where the center of what he's saying is the really important thing, and the things at the beginning and the end, uh, and as they work their way in toward the center, kind of echo one another. In verse 25, he says, the gospel was, or the good news was preached to you. And then in verse 21, he said, so trust in God because of Christ's resurrection. And in verse 22, he says, we were cleansed from sin when we trusted in Christ's resurrection. Then in verse 23, born again, making us born again to an eternal life. And then in verse 24, he says, as opposed to the normal life that decays like grass or like flowers that look beautiful in its time, but eventually wither away and die. And then he finishes in 25, because only God's word is eternal, thus giving those who receive his word eternal life with him. The key here what he's saying is wedged in the end of verse 22, where he says, therefore love each other deeply with all your hearts, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. This is at the heart of what Peter is saying leads to our salvation. And again, this shouldn't be surprising to any of us as Christians. The Bible is very clear that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. That is very, very clear. But at the heart of what it looks like to live for God is to love one another sincerely, earnestly, deeply, meaning taking care of one another, being kind to one another, putting one another's needs before our own. This is what it looks like to live for God. So Peter's saying what we need to do is keep our eyes on the prize. If you play a sport, you know, like football or baseball or basketball or soccer, you know that you have to keep your eye on the ball if you want to score a touchdown, if you want to score a goal, if you want to score a basket, if you want to hit a home run, whatever. If you want to do what you need to do, your base objective, you need to keep your eye on the ball. Track is similar. I'm a, I'm a track coach and athlete, or I was an athlete, now I'm not. But uh, as in track, you're supposed to keep your eyes on the prize, on the finish line. That's what's going to motivate you to actually run to the best of your ability and to get done. Something that I was constantly guilty of in cross country and track, that my coach would tell me every single race I needed to stop doing, is that while I was running, my brain would be thinking, and when my brain is thinking and my body's moving, I tend to look down at my feet, at what's in front of me. And in cross country, that can be important because there can be roots and stumps and branches and and little dips and such that can mess up your ankles if you're not careful. But if you're not keeping your eyes up ahead, you're going to lose sight of where you are in the race. You're not going to see the next racer that you're supposed to catch or pass, and you're just going to be focused on what's right in front of you. 
that's the exact opposite of what Peter is saying that we're supposed to be doing as followers of Jesus. If we want to experience the fullness of the salvation that we are expecting when Jesus returns, we have to keep our eyes on the prize. We have to keep our eyes fixed on him. In the long line of faithful sojourners that scripture gives us as an example, the, the epitome, the ultimate example is Jesus himself. Jesus himself was the ultimate foreigner in exile, uh, the ultimate sojourner who left his home in heaven in order to come to earth and live among us, to walk here on this earth and show us the way that we should live as followers of God, as citizens of his heavenly kingdom. Jesus was the one leading the charge that all of the other faithful sojourners have been following. And if we as Christians are truly living for God, then we are following Jesus in that same path. We are following him in that same direction. And the minute we take our eyes off of Jesus is the minute we start to stray in the wrong direction. That's the minute that we start to get distracted by what it means to be a foreigner, by all of the challenges that this world throws at us. And when we do that, we inevitably lead ourselves into sin. We don't mean to. We go into life with good intentions. We go into our day or into our week with good intentions. But we allow ourselves to be distracted and then we choose to live for ourselves rather than Jesus the minute that we take our eyes off of him. As a Christian, we need to focus on the hope of our salvation if we want to actually reach the finish line, to experience the salvation that we are so eagerly anticipating. The salvation from God should give us an unwavering hope that sets our attention on Jesus day by day, the hope of our future glorification at Christ's return. And so the challenge for us this morning is not just that we need to obey God by loving him and loving others. That's the part we already know. That's the part that makes sense for us. The part that we really need to focus on is that we need to prepare ourselves the same way a soldier prepares for battle, the same way a traveler prepares for their journey. We need to make sure that we start our day off properly focusing on God. In our time in Romania, we chose to do that each day by having every person on our team start the day on their own with their Bibles. Everyone had a quiet time with their Bible each day. And we studied 1 Peter and then 2 Peter and then Jude together as a team throughout the two weeks that we were gone. And by doing that, it's amazing how well we as a team were able to live for God each day. I could tell you stories of every single day, day by day, the ways that I saw the kids have incredible attitudes, the way that I saw them jump in and do exactly what was needed of them, the way that I saw them love on kids that we got to lead as campers at an English camp we put on there in Romania, or loving the missionary family and hanging out with their kids, um, just being kind to them. The ways that I saw our team step up and really genuinely live out their faith were some of the most encouraging things that I have ever been able to experience. Um, Definitely in my time as a pastor, I have never had an opportunity for greater joy than what I got to see out of our high schoolers in those two weeks. And I mean that genuinely and sincerely. It was incredible watching them live out their faith for Jesus day by day. And even though I missed home and I missed my kids, that's what made me want to stay. Not because of Romania and the culture and all of those kind of things. I wanted to stay because I wanted to see our high schoolers continue to live for Jesus faithfully. They prepared themselves every single day. And by doing that, it was they were able to keep their eyes fixed on Jesus. And when we got to the end of each day, we talked about our Bible studies together. We debriefed our day together, talking about ways that we saw God work faithfully, things that encouraged us throughout the day. And we spent time praising God and worshiping God. That helped us keep our focus on God every day. If we're going to take Peter's advice and soberly prepare ourselves for this hope, we need to make sure that we're actually taking steps to do that. And the way that we do that is by spending time in God's word every day, spending time in prayer every day. It's not necessarily easy. Our bodies were getting used to a time zone adjustment and I made them wake up early in order to get time in the Bible every day. But not a single person complained about losing sleep because everyone saw the benefit from day one and onward. And it was incredible. We need to soberly prepare our hope we, need, uh, we know that we need to obey what God teaches in the Bible. We know that we need to love other Christians, but we struggle to do those things because we lose our focus. We need to put all of our attention, moment by moment, day by day, on the hope of our salvation so that we can obey God by loving others. It can be easy for us to do it on a Sunday, 
You get ready for church, you put on your best Jesus-loving face, and maybe you're part of a community group that meets Sunday evenings, and so Sunday's typically not that hard of a day to live for God, but then Monday rolls around, and it can get a lot harder, and then Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and by Saturday, you're like, am I even actually a Christian? It can be really challenging. It's easy for us to keep our focus on Sundays when we have put ourselves in this space to be intentional about our faith, but the minute we remove ourselves from that, it can be a lot harder. That's also why I was disappointed about leaving from Romania, because I saw how faithfully the high schoolers lived for Jesus, and my fear was as soon as we go back home, they're going to go back into their normal routine, and then it's going to be a lot harder for them to choose to put God forward at the beginning of their day every day. And so that's what we spent a lot of the last couple of days talking about was what can we do to make sure that we're still going to live for God every day, that it's not just a while I'm in Romania thing, that it's not just a while I'm at church on Sundays thing, but that it's an everyday thing. And what we came to the consensus of is as long as we're doing a good job making sure that we start our day off with God in the word and in prayer, we'll keep our eyes fixed on him throughout the day. And when we do that, the hope of our salvation will carry us through the hard times and difficulties that we might experience as sojourners in this life. When you're struggling with a bad attitude at work, when you're struggling with lust in a relationship or on your phone with things that you shouldn't be looking at, when you're wanting to get out of a situation and you want to lie or be dishonest or whatever you want to do, when you're tempted to live for the culture of our world instead of the culture of our heavenly kingdom, it's the keeping our focus on Jesus and the hope of our salvation that will allow us to make the decisions that we know that we should as followers of Jesus. That's what will carry us through the hard times and difficulties that we face because Jesus is the ultimate example for us. And as long as we keep fixed on him, he will lead us in the way that we should go. Let's pray and then let's worship together. Father, I thank you for the example of all of the faithful people of yours that have come through history that we have um, recorded in scripture. People like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, people like David, um, people like Peter and John and James, and most of all, and especially your son, Jesus for the example that he set in living a perfect life and laying down his life for us. God, I thank you for that. And I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes fixed on him and the hope of salvation we have through him and the blood that he shed. I pray that you would help us to remember that day by day so that we could make decisions with our speech, with our actions, with our thoughts that honor and glorify you. And I pray that you would be immeasurably blessed as you see us faithfully living for you each day. And I ask this in your name. Amen. We are going to uh, wrap up our time in worship together this morning, and I believe that some of our men will be walking around with some um, baskets to take an offering if you have, um, a, if you feel, feel moved to give toward the, the work the Lord is doing in and through our church body here. Um, but just my final encouragement to us as a church, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and start by doing so through the songs that we sing now. Souls looking to the living God.